Welcome to the Team Fulling Kazan podcast. In this episode, we'll catch up with BJJ brown belt and coach Steve Murgatroyd. But we start by talking to head coach Mark Spencer. He gave us an update of things happening in and around the gym. And we started off by talking to him about the unfortunate cancellation of the IMAF Asian Championships. Yeah, that's right. I mean, from Full and Kazan, we had uh, Joe competing, uh, Marie Spencer and Jackie Harper, who's been training with us as well. Who's also uh, one of the key coaches over at AVMA and Keithley. Really disappointed in um, all the flights were booked. Uh, we went and got visas, which cost a good couple of hundred quid each. So the, the explanation was there was a bit of a disagreement with the Chinese International Mixed Martial Arts Found, uh, Federation and uh, IMAF, which is the overarching body. But, you know, the, the good news is, um, you know, all the girls have, uh, have been guaranteed slots to compete at the World Championship um, over in Bahrain. So, you know, that's in November now. So, you know, we're just prepping uh, the girls for that. We're trying to get matches as well. So... We've had Marie matched once and, you know, the opponent dropped out within two days, which was pretty disappointing. Um, you know, we've got Joe, luckily, you know, matched on a, a big show over in um, in America, in Florida. So she's competing for their, uh, their title over there. So, you know, that's a, a big international fight for us. Um, you know, it really puts us, uh, I think it really puts us on the map internationally from an amateur point of view as well. And in terms of IMAF, as, as you say, big date for Joe Doyle in Florida. We'll, we'll, look, we'll look for that. We'll maybe talk about that before she sets off again. But uh, all systems go for Bahrain, though, in terms of IMAF. That's the... Um, um, is that the world event, sorry, in Bahrain in November? Yeah, it's the world championship. So yeah. the world championship for the last two years have been in Bahrain. So um, the European championship's been in, uh, in Romania. Uh, this year, um, this year again, Bahrain. You know, Bahrain are really getting behind uh, IMAF, which is brilliant to see. You know, the, uh, the 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 guys over there really investing. You know, quite a lot of money. Um, you know, Joe's been over there once. Um, uh, you know, to uh, to pick up a gold, la- a silver last year. Um, and she said, you know, it we're really good to see the investment that they're doing into uh, into IMAF. So, yeah, all systems go, getting everyone ready, you know, it's, it's good stuff. Do you think that as someone who's been involved in the MMA scene for such a long time and seen so many changes, do you think that IMAF is a, a pathway towards possibly inclusion in some of these big multi-sport events like the Asian Games and, and, and possibly even the Olympics? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see how any other way. Um, It'll be, it'll be interesting. It certainly needs some investment. Um, you know, the, the UK MMAF uh, guys who are, you know, the UK Mixed Martial Arts Federation, they're, they're trying the best, but um, I think it's quite difficult to get the sports council involved and, you know, to get them engaged. I, you know, I speak to, you know, people like Wendy Miller, who's just key, yeah, and, um, you know, uh, uh, try, working with the sports council to get that recognition in the UK that it is a sport. Um, but we need to do that in, in so many different countries to become recognised. So, you know, I, I can't remember how many countries you need to do that to actually get considered for the Olympics. It's a starting point. So, you know, in in October, uh, it's Fulham Kazan's 14th year anniversary. Um, and in that time, it, it has changed. Um, I think these are the first real positive steps that I've seen um, in amateur mixed martial arts. Uh, so, you know, it's a time to be positive. Great stuff. Well, we hope and uh, I suppose pray that uh, we, we do see that development for the sport um, through the IMAF platform and, and, and time will tell. Here at Fulling Kazan, plenty going on. Uh, just had a, a big interclub event, lots of guys stepping onto the map there in different disciplines. Just just round that up for us, if you would, Mark. Yeah, so, you know, I think we took about 10 people over and... Um, you know, we had, we had some of the guys, um, you know, working with us from AVMA and we've gone over to their gym and done some sparring. So Ben Harrison, Marie, Joe, you know, working with Jackie and, and, and the AVMA guys. So it's it's been nice to have those guys with us and, you know, all, all kind of banding together. Um, we, we've had quite a few guys step on the mat or in the cage for the first time um, in this event. Um, you know, we, the likes of kind of Mohammed, um, you know, 
he, he's had a couple of injuries and you know training's been quite difficult for him through Ramadan um, but you know he stepped in had his first mixed martial arts bout and did absolutely wonderful you know against a tough guy from FCPC um, and you know they're a tough gym they're a really good gym so mine stay put in this gym over in Rochdale um, you know they, I think the intention for those guys were his opponent to have that match with Mohammed. you know Mohammed landed some clean shots um, you know, and uh, and some good grappling exchanges. Uh, Josh, big Josh as well, um, did brilliant. Um, you know, he really controlled distance. You know, landed some fantastic strikes, um, and and really showed a massive improvement and discipline in his in his uh, in his bout. Um, you know, Davis as well. So Davis did brilliant in the grappling. Um, great to have Omar Khan back on the mat. You know, he he went up against some really tough guys. Uh, Azim. You know, the, the, the kid's just getting better and better. He's just got his blue belt, you know, and he's going up against, you know, in the media, you know, people who are probably purple belt level and things like that and, and, and just, just putting a clinic on. Um, you know, we, we, we did really well. You know, then we've got some of the other newer guys. So we've got Ross um, and Nathan did the first ever grappling event. You know, um, sorry, Nathan did one before, but, you know, uh, Junction did another one. So... Um, yeah, yeah, really good, really positive, and you know, great to see the new guys coming through. Um, it does tend to be a little bit of a uh, it comes in waves, so you see, you know, certain you know new groups come through together, and you know, the, the guys who are coming through now, it, you know, did wonderful. Yeah, you mentioned um, Nathan then, and that just reminded me. Obviously, we've had the Empire Grappling event not so long ago. A lot of guys in action there, and that, that was a good day out for the gym, certainly as well. I understand. Absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, Mergi kind of worked it out that we for the combat base so combat base won uh, the Gi championship so the overall medals for uh, Gi the overall medals for No Gi and the uh, event uh, team winners uh, and of all those medals Fulin Kazang uh, won uh, 25% of the medals for the team so you know it's 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 something we've done a few times where we, we've come away with quite a few medals Um it's not all about the medals, though. You know, Nathan, you know, had his first ever uh, experience doing a grappling competition. Uh, got a win, got a loss, and got a DQ. So he's pretty much had every experience he can in one one, one, uh, one grappling comp. Uh, but it did wonderful in all of them. Um, you know, we had uh, re jumping back on the mat after a year, um, not competing after a hip operation and things like that. You know, Joe picking up a, a gold in gi. Um, Jacob, Jacob did absolutely wonderful. You know, he, he got a golden uh, uh, no gi and a golden gi. Uh, Oscar, um, you know, coming from a Thai boxing background, got um, a golden gi and a silver in no gi. Um, Jack uh, Gunning got bronze. I can't think of other people. So a lot of guys compete. Yeah, guys and, girls. and they all did brilliant. And, and like I say, you know, not to take away from the guys who didn't uh, get a medal this time, but. Do you know what? The, the, the leaps of improvement for the team as a whole has been wonderful. Great stuff. And looking ahead now, uh, we won't keep you much longer. No, you're always a busy man here at Team Full and Kazan, Mark. But we've got some guys in action, uh, combat challenge coming up, some Full and Kazan fighters entering the cage in that one. Yeah, so we've got Oscar um, going back out again. Um, so, uh, yeah, Oscar's got a fight from uh, a guy from Neo Shoot uh, who are based in Wakefield. Um, we've also got Adi Khan uh, jumping back into the cage. Uh, you know, he's really been uh, getting stuck in back into training. You know, some uh, some big improvements as well. Really working his wrestling work, really working his grappling, doing absolutely brilliant. Uh, and Jack Gunning's back with us as well. And Jack's fighting for a title uh, against uh, Simone uh, from Game Fight. Real tough guy, real you know big fight. You know, if you if you're anywhere in Bradford on that day, you know, just for that fight alone, you need to get down because it's going to be an absolute barn burner. You know, Jack's. You know, Jack's got um, you know a, a tough fighter to go, but you know Simone's got the same. Jack's improvement over the last six months has just been wonderful. Great stuff. And um, any news on uh, Jabid Rahman, who was uh, starring on, on the uh, on the ca- behind in front of the camera, should I say, for uh, a, an MMA website recently? Any any update on on his uh, next bout, next action? Yeah. So he's had uh, two or three opponents now drop out of MTK on the thirteenth of October. 
um, not to kind of curse things, but we think we've got another opponent. Uh, so me and Jab have taken a look at him, and you know it looks like a, a really good first bout for his uh, for his pro debut, where you know he'll be challenged in some areas, but it'll be a good solid fight for for Jab. Um, so fingers crossed we'll be able to announce that pretty soon. Um, and then after that, um, you know, who knows? You know, the, uh, the the world's his oyster, really. So you know, it'd be just great to get in there, get his first uh, professional bout, and and uh, really, you know, put his first stamp on the uh, professional MMA scene. Now, coming up, we're going to talk in more depth about the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu classes here at Team Full in Kazan with Mr. Steve Murgatroyd. Wait out for that. It's coming your way, but I can't let you go without asking you about your forthcoming forays onto the BJJ competition mat. Uh, you've got a couple of uh, dates penciled in, I understand. Testing yeah. the black belt out. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it's been difficult because the, the IMAF stuff uh, really threw things out of kilter a little bit, so... Um, I'm currently trying to cut weight for Hereford, so I'm going to see how that goes. Um, I potentially am, uh, depending on jab getting matched at MTK, fighting at the Nogi British. Um, at the moment, you know, we, with MMA, it's really difficult to get stuff in for me. So um, I am putting stuff in, but you know, we've got such a fight team, we've got such a you know a set of guys who, who uh, are going out and getting. You know these really big opportunities. It, it for me, I, I always find it a little bit hard to be selfish. You know, you know the people tend to come before me. So um, yeah, I, I'd really like to, but we'll just see what the next six months brings. That was Team Fulin Kazan head coach Mark Spencer. It's now time to talk more about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu here at Team Fulin Kazan and talk to coach and brown belt Steve Murgatroyd. We started our chat by asking Steve how he got into BJJ. In uh, in my late teens, I was a, a karate guy and kickboxing. And uh, it was around about 1998, 99, and I was reading a lot of Jeff Thompson self-defence type books. And he was an advocate of, of grappling. And at the time, I had no idea what it was, and... I read a book called Animal Day, which uh, added in some sort of judo, wrestling and jiu-jitsu type martial arts. And from then I, I thought that I needed that from a self-defence point of view to complement the, the striking skills. Jeff Thompson, for anybody who doesn't know, is quite a, a well-known, well-recognised uh, self-defence uh, practitioner, I think, in, in the UK, that's fair to say. So, so that was your starting point, and just tell us how things kicked on from there to the point now where you're a brown belt and, and taking sessions at Team Full in Kazan. Yeah, so I, um, I, I did an internet search around that time to see what was about in relation to submission fighting, and there was a forum called SFUK, which was Submission Fighting UK, that had a, a, a forum on it with people asking for different clubs around the country, and I put a post up about Bradford, and up popped Mark Spencer. And there was a there was a, a, a small club in Bradford, which was well, it wasn't even a club at the time. It was it was a guy called Darren Ward, who is now a, a Gracie Barra black belt, who was taking Valetudo type classes, free fight. wasn't even called MMA then. Didn't really have a name. And I met Mark. I think it was probably around October two thousand. And um, we went and we, we did a, 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 a no-gi sort of MMA session then. And and then it kicked on from there, really. So at the time, I was still involved with the strike inside of it. And we we moved around gyms in West Yorkshire. So we went over a lot to Andy Williams over in Huddersfield uh, for the jiu-jitsu side. And also we had a gym in Bradford called Kickers with Darren Good, who's a uh, Gracie Barra brown belt, and Tom Harris, who's a, a black belt, Gracie Barra. And we were still mixing it all together, although even, even at that time it was, it was still known as sort of cross-training rather than MMA as a sport in itself. Uh, over the years, I mean, I, I left the sport in a, probably about 2002, 2003 for six years while I went away and studied a changed career into law and came back to it probably about 2009, 2010 and 
really just stuck to the jujitsu side of it then because I'd pretty much got sick of being punched in the face. <laughs> so that's that was then the start of your pathway to, to real progression, which clearly you're now, now achieving. Um, as I say, you take the Tuesday night BJJ session at Team Fulling Kazan. Just describe a typical BJJ class then at, at Team Foo, if you would. Well, it's an hour in length. There's a, a short sort of five or ten minute warm-up at the beginning with some um, cardio-type moves and uh, there's some sort of stretching I wouldn't say it's yoga based, but just just stretch all body stretching, uh, just to get you ready for the for the session. And then it's usually two techniques from a specific position that we we will work on with 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 a partner. And thereafter, there's probably about fifteen to twenty minutes worth of of, of open sparring uh, between those people who want to spar, which is pretty much everybody once they've they've got over the first couple of months of it. Now, the phrase sparring, if someone's thinking about just starting BJJ, might sound a little bit intimidating. What would you say to somebody thinking about starting training at Team Falling Kazan, specifically in BJJ? Well, it's, it, it, the, the, there is a, a, a saying that, that jiu-jitsu is for everybody. I probably disagree with that myself in a sense that it, it, it is full contact. Uh, but it's, it, it's an honest martial art. And I think that if, if anyone's going to come down and wants to get fit and do something that's still got a lot of honesty to it, particularly because of the fact that you can spar it at um, full contact without getting hurt, because if, if you get to a point where you are going to be submitted by your opponent, you simply tap onto them, I tap your hand on them, and you, you stop and start again. So it's not... A case where you, you, you're going to get knocked out or you're going to get hurt or arms broke or anything like that. So it, it's it's definitely something worth having a go at. And don't be intimidated by it. Everybody down there comes from a martial arts background. There's a lot of respect and a lot of good people to train with and nobody's there to hurt anybody. So it's... Um, and, and, I, and I think, you know, for, for, for younger people but also for people who are a little bit older who still want to have a go at martial arts and a proper martial art um, rather than a sort of traditional one where you're not getting any full contact or cardio it's, it's worth having a go what would you say um, you, you yourself have really majored in recent times on the competition scene and that competition element is a significant part of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu if you want it to be what would you say about competition in general terms uh, to anybody involved in the sport what are your views on it and, and what do you make of the scene and, and what's the experience of competition like I suppose I, I've got a, a, a love hate relationship with competing for, for a lot of years I shied away from it and I let the nerves, or my nerves, get the better of me. Over recent years, I've overcome that, and the, the only way that I've overcome that is by um, uh, desensitising myself to the environment, to the, to the long day, to the nerves building up to it, to the having to lose a little bit of weight the week before, to the fact of driving three and a half hours to go down and have a, a match against somebody, and ultimately, you either win or you lose. Uh, but I think that, that, that what, what the positives that you gain from competition in a jiu-jitsu sense and in a life sense are a lot more than the negatives that I've just mentioned. And I think the, uh, the, the, the things that you get from competing in jiu-jitsu for your life and also from a technical side uh, are worth doing. Um, I, I, you know, if, if from, from a day-to-day -day basis, if I've got an angry client at work who I've got to contact on the telephone, it, it doesn't bother me anymore because I've, you know, I'm used to that. That what's going to happen? What's the worst that can happen over the telephone with somebody at work? You know, when, when you've when you've drove four hours and you, you've been strangled by somebody. <laughs> so from from that point of view, it's it, it's developed me as a person. But also competition from a jiu-jitsu side, it, in that five or ten minutes that you, 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 you're competing down there, you, you find out a lot about your game and you can you find out a lot about the holes in your game and where, you, where you're doing well and where you're doing not so well. So it, it's, it, it's not everything in, in jiu-jitsu, but it's certainly something that's helped me progress a lot further. Yeah, people say, don't they, that... Uh 
competition time is like a supercharge for your, your skill development in jiu-jitsu or your, your progress. Would you agree with that? Has that been your experience? Yeah, without a doubt. And the other cliche is that you learn a lot more from a loss than you do from a win. And, and I genuinely have found that as well, that, that I've, I've took, taken a lot more away or I've taken a lot more techniques away from other people who beat me in competition than I have when I've maybe, maybe won uh, in a competition. So, yeah, yeah, I definitely think so. Now, clearly, from what we've said so far, you've got vast experience in BJJ. How, how do you think, if, if at all, the sports or the, the, the discipline, let's say, has changed since you became involved in it? Perhaps a, a shift to, to more sporting opportunities and less self-defence, but, but what do you think? I, I, well, I've got a, I've got a good sort of um, insight to this in a sense that, as, as I said at the beginning, that I went away in two thousand and two when it was a, a, a minority of people in, in around here that were doing it, and then coming back to it again after the MMA boom and the popularity of of, of this side of, the, of contact sports had had grown massively. So I think back two thousand and one to pulling mats out into a sports centre, um, paying your subs uh, and getting on with it. And if a blue belt turned up, it was like you were in the presence of, 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 <laughs> of, of Chuck Norris. Um, I mean, at Kickers, we had, a, we had a guy called Chad who came over, who was a blue belt, and it, it was literally like a different level to, to, to putting it forward to, to modern time now. There's a lot of blue belts, a lot of purple, brown, all, all the colour belts, and there's loads of black belts as well. And people are running full-time academies. And there seems to be a lot of people who are making money or want to make money out of jiu-jitsu. Whereas back then, it, I don't know, n nobody even thought of it as a career. Which is probably why a lot of the um, older jiu-jitsu guys now have actually got careers and jobs and just supplement it with, with the jiu-jitsu as a part-time hobby. Um, I don't know whether there's any money in it long-term for people, but it, it seems to be that there's, there's people making money, so good luck to them. And do you think um, the arts changed, that the discipline, the sport, the, the, the well, the combat art has changed significantly from when you started? I, I think you've got people coming into Brazilian jiu-jitsu now who have done no martial arts whatsoever in the past. They've got no martial arts background. They're coming at this as, as, as the first thing. They're coming to it from rugby or just from a fitness point of view. Whereas back then... Everybody who trained in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu had, had already had, had exposure to different martial arts, be it from traditional martial arts or, like me, from a striking background to uh, bouncers and police officers coming in wanting to look at it from that self-defence point of view, whereas now I think a lot of people are seeing it for the, for the sport that it is. Uh, and we're not even going down the route of it being... Uh, a supplementary to a, a mixed martial arts programme that somebody would be following. So you think it's it's obviously sort of gained a certain momentum then that people are attracted to it, like they might be attracted to something like, I don't know, CrossFit, and think, well, I fancy having a go at that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think for, for, for sure there's definitely a, a still a minority uh, feel about the sport, even though it's grown within my circle, that's because I I love it and I watch it and I'm looking at it. But if, if I walk down the street with a British Open medal on, uh, th there's there's going to be 10 out of 10 people who are just going to look at me and wonder what I'm doing. I, I hear on the radio that they always talk about different sports being the fastest growing sport in the UK. And there must be thousands of the fastest growing sports because every sport is it's definitely growing. Whether it's reached the mass market yet, I don't know, but I think probably within the next sort of five to ten years, I think it will be, and that the, 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 it will that will in, in itself bring its own issues uh, with 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 continued regulation of it, and it doesn't really want to be watered down like a lot of traditional martial arts are, where you've got a five-year-old kid who's a, a, a black belt, which is just nonsense. Yeah, it's um, it'll be interesting to see how BJJ develops and, and deals with uh, all those issues that you've outlined. Um, so as somebody then so immersed in the sport, um, which particular elite practitioners, uh, the real top level at world level, do you, do you sort of follow and look at out of interest for inspiration and, and maybe a few technical points as well? I, I, I try and look at uh, different players who are a similar weight to me 
and so I, I look at people like like Leandro Lowe, who I think's got a really good collar and sleeve Deliva game, and uh, I think he's a fascinating guy because he's come up uh, up up through different weights uh, throughout his career. I mean, he just seems to be getting bigger and bigger. I like the the gym that he's got in Sao Paulo. It looks really mean and scary, <laughs> um, but it but it, it looks like they've got a decent ethos there. I also like looking at uh, the, the Unity Gym in New York for a similar reason. It just seems it's a bit more spit and sawdust. It, it seems to be a sweat box and there's one shower. It's got the M- Mayow brothers there who are a lot smaller than me, but I like to watch their game because it looks like a different sport a lot of the time. There, there's a guy there called uh, Devontae Johnson who's just got his black belt and he's a he's just a big unit but he's got a really good game and i like Roger Gracie watching uh, his his game as well because from a fundamentally fundamental point of view it's very sound and you can't argue with the with the success that he had over the years um in 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 sport jiu jitsu now, you mentioned Roger Gracie. Um, I know as part of your coaching, you will look at online techniques and, and um, websites that these elite practitioners do set up. There's, there's Roger Gracie, there's University of Jiu-Jitsu by Saulo Ibero. Um, what do you think about those sort of resources? Can they be beneficial to people? Um, are they just beneficial for coaches? How, how do you see them? I, th- I, th- I think they can be the, the, the beneficial for, 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 for everybody, but I think you've got to be careful with them to an extent because um, th- there's, there's, there's so much inf- information, uh, on the, particularly on the, on the Mendez Brothers uh, paid site and also Marcelo Garcia's site and, and even uh, Braulio, Braulio Estima's site as well. Th- th- there's there's a, just such a labyrinth of, of, of information that, that you could blow your own mind of it it's you could you could spend as much time on that as you might do watching david ike documentaries on youtube that that <laughs> you you could you could go down this rabbit hole of berimbolos and uh, all, all sorts of funky crazy stuff that that as a beginner will take you away from the the, the fundamental principles and and techniques that are going to uh, do you justice getting used to the sport so, so i think i think i mean i, I bought the the university of jiu-jitsu book years ago and a lot of it didn't make sense at the time and i may go back to it now and like you say looking at roger grace's site and the mendez brothers for me now that's looking at just from from a, a, a maybe a, a marginal gains or or a, or a adding to fundamental techniques and i think you've got to have a certain level of understanding of, of the mechanics of jiu-jitsu before you go down those rabbit holes with with some of the techniques because otherwise it's going to look too complicated it's you're going to be become obsessed with with, with, the, with the flashy techniques and when you get back to rolling with somebody 100 uh, percent you, you're going to find that a lot of it doesn't work or you, you you've not you've not picked it up in the correct way so yes online websites are good for additional learning, but it can't be working uh, with with, with a, a teammate or with a coach and really drilling maybe two techniques in a, in, a, in a lesson and really getting getting to grips with it there. Because because if somebody's coaching, they can they can just move your hand a little bit or they can they can say where you where you where you're going wrong or going right with a technique. Whereas if you're watching it, you've just got your own interpretation of what's going on. And at what point that you're going to apply that? Okay, so um, I think the message there is uh, fundamentals first, and, and and get on the mat first, and maybe at some point in your development, those sort of things will be right. That's a fascinating insight for us. Uh, thanks for your time, Steve. We'll let you go in a moment, but just a final message, if you would, to anybody maybe thinking about coming down, having a go at BJJ at Team Fulham Kazan. What what would your message be to them? I'd, I'd say come down. Make sure it fits in with your timetable, with work and family, because after all, this is just a hobby for 99% of us, and you don't want it to get in the way of of normal life, because if you can't fit it into your normal daily routine, you're not going to stick to it. It's going to become a chore. If it's 40 miles away from you, it's probably going to be a little bit too far going up and down in the traffic. Um, But give it a go. 
what's the worst that can happen? Thanks for listening to the Team Full in Kazan podcast. You can find out more at bradfordmma.com and follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram.